Hello. Um, we're streaming a little early this week because I do have another show with uh, Javier Mackey coming on Sunday um, to discuss wokeism in the military. So that will be, I think, an absolutely fantastic and informative show. Um, and I don't know if I'll be um, able to make like much too much content in February. Um, I'll probably be busy with all sorts of things. The uh, Skildings event, however you say that, is happening in February, and I've got all sorts of stuff going on, so uh, it's my birthday as well. But uh, today, we are going to get back on one of my favorite topics to discuss, which is what I call iatric theosis. Um where we analyze the uh, book Medical Nemesis, um, Ivan Illich's Medical Nemesis, which um, I I uh, I only realized yesterday that um, he has the same name as that book written by uh, Leo Tolstoy, The Death of Ivan Illich, or or whatever it was called. Um, but if you missed the previous two parts, um, fear not, because you know each part. It's not really linear. Um, we're, we're going to look over, um, you know, each episode's kind of its own, uh, subject. The first episode, we talked about the general idea of over medicalizing our, our lives. Um, and, uh, the second episode, we went over the obsession with therapy, modern obsession with therapy. But this time we're digging a little deeper, getting a little spiritual here. Uh, as we look at um, death. So before we get through to the slideshow, um, and I'll probably end up talking about this, I just kind of wanted to maybe give a little intro on you know my own personal uh, view of death and and why it seems to have have changed um, over time, where it, it's almost a it's 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 uh oh we got oh, okay one of those uh, weird things um where it used to be something that we accept right um i guess we'll let people pour in here i don't know if anyone's really be wa uh, watching this um but uh death used to be seen as something that was very much just a part of life it was almost celebrated it was almost there are certain cultures um you know pagan europe and uh china um or was it i think it's china um death is is almost seen as a um it's almost something you celebrate you know you celebrate the person's life uh when they die and and kind of celebrate their passage on to this this new existence which we'll we'll talk about that later um but ultimately it was always seen as something very real and a part of existence like it could happen any moment um, we were always very conscious of it and prepared for it. Um, and nowadays, it's something that we push back. We keep pushing back, keep pushing back. Um, you know, it seems, especially with women, once they reach their 30s, they're always trying to claw back into their 20s. Um, you know, and I, 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 I won't leave men out of this, but you could especially see it with women because they age much quicker than men, right? It's much more defined. Um, uh, men generally age much more gracefully. Uh, nonetheless, you can see it with all kinds of people um, where they try to maintain uh, kind of where they reached their prime, which generally for most people, if it's not their teens or their early 20s, it's, it's somewhere that, around there for a lot of people. And so they try, as they as as they may as they might to uh, to extend their youth. Um, and in doing so, once they reach their forties, fifties, sixties, depending on how healthy they are, they start to morph their existence into trying to maintain their life. You know, and and the and the more unhealthy they are, the more focused they are, and and not really at peace they are with their unhealthy decisions throughout their life. Because unhealthfulness 
is very much correlated to spiritual immaturity because the more unhealthy you are, the more it's kind of obvious you never grew. You know, you kind of stayed in this childlike mindset of always wanting to get candy, right? Uh, and candy can mean many things that are unhealthy. But um, let's start the 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 slides here, and we'll. Um, I have the page. I just realized I have. Uh, I want to have the pages up because this chapter. Um, the section of the book of Medical Nemesis that uh, Ivan, uh, about halfway through, um, he starts talking about death, um, what he calls uh, death, uh, death against death, chapter five, um, and before that, the invention and elimination of disease. Um, and uh, I wanted to bring up those pages so that I can um, kind of read some of that stuff because it's just potent. Um, I'm going through that chapter before that's The clinical approach to sickness ha gave birth to a new language which spoke about diseases at the bedside and to a hospital reorg reorganized and classified by disease for the exhibition of ailments to students. The hospital which at the very beginning of the 19th century had become a place for diagnosis, was now turned into a place for teaching. So it would become a laboratory for experimenting with treatments and towards the turn of the century, a place concerned with therapy. Today, the pest house has been uh, transformed into a compartmentalized repair shop, right? And why is that? It's because um, something that was very much relegated to a small section of society which was doctoring, you know, medical doctors were very, you know, there weren't really specialists. They, they were generally people who were well-rounded in certain, like, how to remedy these things and maybe help out a little bit. But it wasn't, it, it wasn't, you'd go to the hospital, ultimately, um, well, I won't get into that because I don't really know the history of hospitals, which we might talk about at some point on here. Um, but it obviously became into something where there's specialists. And if you have cancer, I really, cancer is an important thing here because cancer just used to kill you, right? If you, if, if you went through that stage of just getting sick out of nowhere before this hospitalization and medicalization of life, um, right, you just kind of accepted your your the, the this 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 part of you that's dying like you are going through death now and maybe you'll recover through a miracle right it was a spiritual endeavor now it's become something where i go to this specialist and i do this treatment and i spend twenty thousand dollars on this and it's it's just this hall as i keep saying it's a hall of mirrors um and so right and and you see that you know, when something becomes extremely financialized, when it becomes when the profit motive motive has been added to it, what happens? You get all these little things like, well, yeah, buddy, you come to me and I'll take care of this part of your toe and you can go to that guy and he'll take part of take care of that other part of that toe. It's very specialized because what better when people are obsessed with their own, you know, mortality, um, they they will do anything to stay alive rather than just accepting that it is a, it is a part of existence, you know, you living day by day, you know, you, no one does that. No one lives in the now anymore. It's very, everything is very much a part of, I mean, he even talks about, you know, the, the obsession, you know, how clocks are everywhere now. Um, but time, the obsession with time, in the past and the future, rather than just experiencing the beauty of now. Um, but we'll get into the slideshow. We'll get into this. Um, looks like we might, it might just be me. Uh, but for anyone who watches this in the future, uh, I do hope you enjoy. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics to discuss. Uh, obviously, because we now live in uh, a bio-Leninist uh, 
dystopia. Why? And I'm again, we won't get in a tangent here, but why? It's because everyone's fat. Everyone is in the process of premature death of of diseases that could easily be solved by changing their lifestyle for the better. Um, we, in fact, if you go on TikTok, apparently, uh, you'll find fat people who just talk about fat liberation. All right. The idea of responsibility and taking care of one's health um, in, in an intuitive sense, like just brushing your teeth and and eating properly and not giving in to your addictions and your and your uh, desires. It, it, it's because we are a morally relativist society um, and nihilistic and materialistic. We we don't view being healthy as an objective uh, phenomenon. It's something that you just do yourself. If you find eating um, five cheeseburgers a day as as healthy, then you can do it. Uh, and I will say, dieting, uh, the obsession of people wanting to diet in really weird ways is is honestly just the the other end of this, right? Um, just eat what your ancestors ate. Jesus Christ. <laughs> just, just eat, eat the beef, eat the, you know, eat the, eat the greens, just eat what your grandparents ate. Uh, well, probably your great grandparents, because we've lived in this, you know, new materialistic world for quite a while now, actually. But, uh, all right, now we'll get into the slides. So we'll go to, if you have medical nemesis with you, turn to page uh, 247. Um, where was it? So he, he says, yes, I'll, I'll read my part. I might go into his book. I might not, but, um, I kind of just did that because there's stuff I think I want to read. Um, the process of viewing death as a reminder of the joy of being alive and what man has been persistently blessed with by his Lord has been killed by the lowering of death's status as something we are prepared for spiritually and emotionally. As he says, uh, the every man carried his own death with him and dances with it through his life. Death was represented not as an anthropomorphic figure, but as a macabre self-consciousness, a constant awareness of the gaping grave. With the rise of material wealth, the bourgeois family, um, death become Death became something for the lower class to experience in prolongation of life as far as it could go. Then dying in a hospital bed was seen as right and proper. The fear of death is cemented in modern man's mind as something to avoid rather than accept. Um, and all uh, so. Yeah, at this point, the mirror uh, in the Middle Ages. Wait, uh, he he's very much a tangential guy, even more than I am. Um, so you can't really like pick up a part of a, the book and read it. You got to start like way far back. Um, but we'll read it. This actually, this is good. Primitive societies conceived of death as a result of an intervention by an alien actor. They did not contribute personality to death. Death is the outcome of someone's evil intention. This somebody who causes death might be a neighbor who, in envy, looks at you with an evil eye. Or it might be a witch, an ancestor, who comes to pick you up. Or the black cat that crosses your path. Throughout the Christian and Islamic Middle Ages, death continued to be regarded as the result of a deliberate personal intervention of God. No figure of a death appears at the deathbed. Just an angel and a devil struggling over the soul, escaping from the mouth of the dying. Only during the 15th century were the conditions ripe for a change in this image and for the appearance of what would later be called a natural death. The dance of the dead represents this readiness. Death can now become an inevitable, intrinsic part of human life. Rather than the decision of a foreign agent, death becomes autonomous and for three centuries coexists as a separate agent uh, with the immortal soul, with divine providence and with angels and de uh, demons. So that's actually... You can kind of tell that's kind of like taken out of context. Um, but the idea, let's evaluate that. The idea of life and death being a, very commingled, right? You're, you're very aware of your death, and it's this extremely spiritual experience that one prepares for 
at a certain point as their health starts to deteriorate. And it's not something where they're like, oh, shit, stop. No, I can go here and I can. Oh, and he'll uh, give me these uh, pills that can make me live even longer. And, it, you know, I mean, it, it's it's kind of interesting. You know, you think about like, you know, people who lived into their hundreds never went through this. Um you know, and even if they did, why is it that some people live to 70 and some people live to one, uh, 115, right? It, it, this obsession with prolonging life in a way that's not even really dependable is an experience. Um, it, it's an experience of weakness, right, in, in the modern person. They don't really realize, like, no, your ancestors lived in, well into their 60s, 70s, and 80s depending on how, you know, truly fraught with disease they were and, and depending on what time they lived or whatever, generally the average human life lit is that long, um, 60s and 70s. And so, um, I'm going to read the title there, but the metamorphosis of natural death, right? So the concept of death has gone through a metamorphosis and he talks about it in that chapter. Um, through over about 2000 years, you know, from from pagan Europe into Christian Europe into more advanced Europe past the Middle Ages, the idea of death metamorphized over time. But you get into the 1800s, especially into the early 1900s, the idea of prolonging life came into being. He mentions how Francis Bacon was the first person to really talk about medicine and i think uh one of freaking francis um 1600s the idea of prolonging life uh w with medicine actually came to be he had a quote i forgot what it was but you know he just mentions what medicine is used for out of context he he, he quotes francis bacon um but fate was something we were very well aware of right um let's go over this again uh Yes, rise of material wealth. So the bourgeois family, it's it's literally seen as like a, you're of lower status if you don't go into medical debt to stay alive. Um, you're you're a fool, honestly. Um, so next slide. Misunderstanding the age of death. OK, so I literally just talked about that, but we'll go through it. In a genuine misunderstanding of where death comes from and sent astray on the long journey to try and extend one's own life, the modern person thinks that their natural age of death, say 65, can be extended further past 80, when really that extension will be fraught with an endless medical hall of mirrors. They will need constant medical attention, spending as much money as they made their entire life to push away their fate. Rather than accepting fate, they outright hate it. The average person with decent genes who took care of themselves should live well into their 70s and 80s, much as their ancestors did. But through a compulsion and spiritual lack of lack of spiritual growth, they are tricked into thinking they must spend all their time mending made-up ails that in days of yore would have gone unnoticed or simply embraced as a facet of their of this person's life. And so the idea of um of extending your life of uh of yes mending ails that otherwise you wouldn't know about you know you can go to a doctor and he'll tell you like i, I this is a bad example but um it's 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 worth mentioning is i recently when i was at the dentist um they told me uh and by the way, you don't really have to go to a dentist. You can get your, you can clean your teeth on your own um, with a little, um, which I've talked about before. There are, you know, and and I and I and I guarantee you, if you if you asked Ivan Illich, do you hate all doctors and should all medical treatment be, you know, abolished or whatever? And within that, there's nuance. It's the idea of feeling like you need to maintain yourself via a doctor and in and, and, ex and being exploited by a system that really wants you to pay more money to live longer and be healthy when really it comes down to your own maintenance of yourself. Again, people lived well into their 70s and 80s pre all of this, right? Um, nonetheless, uh, 
I uh, at the dentist, they said that I have fluorosis and it's because I grew up in Houston where um, there's too much. Literally, there's too much fluoride in the water supply. And so um, right when I would brush my teeth or drink tap water, I definitely drink more tap water these days. Um, I would get white splotches on my teeth because of all the fluoride. And so now my teeth especially like my front teeth here or whatever, they're extremely white um, because of all the fluoride that, you know, I brushed on them for several years. Um, so if anyone's got the fluoride stare, it's me. Anyway, there's an example. Like I would have never known about that. Maybe I would have noticed, like I have noticed before, like, hey, my teeth are abnormally white in this certain area. But really, I've never been like, it's never been something I'm insecure about. It's not, and because you know, and you shouldn't be insecure about how you look and who you are. I mean, that's something that's, it's, it's not something you should want to warp and destroy. But that's a conversation for another time. Um, you know, I. It's just it's something I never would have thought about, right? Um, I think also whitening your teeth is one of the dumbest, stupidest, just bourgeois things you could ever do. Um, other than plastic surgery. Um, it's so insecure. It's so full of denial. No one should be spending their life insecure about how they look. Okay, we're not going to get on this. Nonetheless, it, it really falls into the same thing, this idea of trying to extend your life and, you know, getting well past 30 and realizing like, hey, I'm not young anymore. I'm at the point where I'm about to reach my peak and I'm going to start you know, becoming more unhealthy because old. Um, and you're going to start seeing this more because we're at a point and I've discussed this and I, and I will continue to discuss it where the population is flattening and it will start to peter off and go down in the latter end of the 21st century. And is something I, I've, I, I do want to discuss at some point is kind of, you know, dysgenic admixture, right? Um, there are people just being, who were born with, you know, certain diseases or inherited them due to the just absolute spike in population uh, from 1800 to 2000. And so there's all these people with all of the, these genes that, you know, put them in the wild, they won't survive because they just, they're extremely, they need a very sanitized, enclosed environment to survive. And even then, the average age is, has been flat since like 2010 um, or so. Because, you know, you, right, that you, you can't extend life past a certain point, nor can you pretend that people who have, you know, whether it be diseases due to their overweightness, which again, 78% of, of uh, Americans are overweight. And so you're going to get those, those issues. But yeah, something I, I think is interesting to, to look at is the medical establishment will continue to be something that, that people obsess over um, because there are so many people out there who really rely on it to stay alive, um, and even then, as we've as we've talked about, um, you're making a trade off when, say, you take this drug to take care of this part of your body. You're you're going to capitulate another part of your body, and ultimately, those drugs will have long term effects on you. Um, there's a reason a lot of old people and a lot of very fat people. You know, they take certain drugs, but ultimately they're only expected to live in years after, you know, being prescribed those drugs. It's like the uh, it's like the the thing that I'm not allowed to talk about that everyone has been, you know, uh, been forced to get. I, you know, I haven't gotten it and I never will. And they'll have to inject. I'll say, it, yeah, they can, they have to inject it in my cold, dead body. Right. But. That's just another thing. It's like if you're 80 years old, it might make sense to get it. Nonetheless, it's just like, like, you know, right? They, they, it's 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 a it's a 
it's a utilitarian argument, but that right. And I'm not here to make utilitarian arguments. I'm here to make spiritual arguments. Hello, my friend. I, I did not, yeah. Hey man, Joff Lothian. We'll stick to that. Um, it's good to see you, my dude. Um, let's see what you said. For sure. It's almost unfathomable how unfit the population is. I didn't even realize for the longest time how extreme it was because I just wasn't exposed to it. Yeah, so down south, um, we literally are the fattest people in the world besides Pacific Islanders and give or take uh, Arabic countries, Arabic oil countries. Um, but in the Western world, by far, we are an anomaly down here because, I mean, the average American woman is 180 pounds. She weighs more than me, right? And I'm tall. Um, but if you condense it down to the South, I mean, it's probably a lot worse than that. And what do you do for people like that, right? You, um, in, in a medicalized world, we tell them, take these drugs and exercise, I guess, right? It's, it's, it's turned into this, hey, you can live if you just eat that or uh, if you uh, take this drug um, and you'll see it. I mean, if, if you... Something I've no, I, I talked about it in um, like the first stream, I think, but old people, if you're around them a lot, you know, w next time you're with old people, um, especially older fat people, just listen to them talk and realize you'll realize something how 90 percent of the time all they talk about is the drugs they're taking or man, I need to go there and get my, you know, these drugs and I need to go there and get this uh um, to get this uh, treatment done, you know, I, I literally, I, I never go to the doctor and I, and I am very pretty healthy. I, so I just literally don't know how, I don't know any of the jargon. So I'm really trying here, but basically, right. If you're with an old person or an obese person, that's all they talk about is like, I, um, oh man, I don't know if I forgot if I talked about this too, but I was doing work. I'll just say I was doing work at a place. I travel a lot for work. And this place I was working at, there was an obese woman. And she was talking to her cohort. By, by the way, she had her mask on, cloth mask. Um, and she was saying to her less obese friend, coworker, um, all the, uh, uh, what was it? She was talking about, oh, yeah, she was out of breath. And She's like, they gave me a steroid. And I, after she taught, you know, said her piece, I interjected and said, you know, I, steroids never work. Steroids, depending on the issue, um, they'll help whatever issue for the first two to four weeks or whatever. I know this because just, if you know old people, they, <laughs> they talk about their health issues. Um, but she was, and I told her like, that doesn't help. And unfortunately, we don't live in China where they're just straight up like, hey, you're fat, lose weight, that'll fix your issue. We live in a uh, feminized Western world. And so I couldn't just say, hey, lady, you're like, you weigh three of me. Maybe that's your issue. 100% of the time, if you are with someone who is obese, I, you know, any issue they have, liter literally, I mean, any issue they have. It can be solved by, hey, guy, uh, hey, lady, lose some weight. Anyway, it's the same with being old. We'll get back to that uh, because we're not going to. This is not hate on fat people stream, um, though, you know. <laughs> um, we're taught we're hating we're hating on old people. Um, we're hating on boomers, basically, because. That's what's happened with the the older population in, the, in in the West, especially, but it really around the world because the Faustian man never stopped expanding, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah, old people basically, and I, I mean, I, what I was getting at with with like 
inherited diseases and such. Obviously, people will feel very reliant on the system, but also people, you know, if you had a bad leg, you know, pre 1800s, pre 1900s ish, you generally, if you didn't live in this modern world, you just had a bad leg. You still worked, you figured out your way. You know, it was something, it was a part of you. It was who you were, right? It's like, um, it's like the color of your hair or, you know, like I got, I got a, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, a diverted septum or whatever. And it's really probably because, um, I don't, it's not something I like was born with. It was something I think I got, uh, cause I don't remember having deviated septum when I was younger. It's either. It's probably from um, I fainted once and smashed my face on a counter. Um, I think that's what did it, but who knows? Nonetheless, it's who I am. Do I want to go spend 2000 or f however much money it takes to fix it? No, it's who I am. Why would I, I want to change the quirks and, and what makes me me? I mean, that's the thing about just living in general, living in this reality is experiencing the bizarre inconsistencies that you see everywhere. Everything is deep. Everything has a story. Why would you want to perfect it to a point of, of over-sanitization? It's, it's like um, I was watching a Prudentialist stream, he, the Ben-Hur stream he did. I only got like two hours through so far because it's four hours long, but they were saying how like it was such a great point, how... Uh, I think it was Prude, it may have been Geo, how you watch like the, an Avengers movie and it's just like sanitized crap. I mean, it really, it's like you're not immersed in it whatsoever. It's it's like candy. But you go back and watch these fantastic works of art like Ben-Hur. And I mean, it's the same with music too. You can make the same exact argument. Um, it's, it's, it, th there's, there's depth and you can appreciate the limited technology they have or how they got you know fa you know fancy with things because they had to in in new films you, you don't get fancy because you just have computer generated bs and it's it, it, it's it's these little things in life that make life beautiful right that that is beauty right jesus jesus um or rather you know god wrestled with jacob and broke his hip and you know now now jacob has a broken hip um think about the limp he walked with right it it's 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 in the process of wrestling with god he he broke something i mean god took something from him in a way and 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 still he you know <laughs> started israel um so in a way you know you're the the downsides of living are what make it fantastic you know, that, that, that's why suffering and that, that's why one of the things that really led me to the Christian faith is suffering is an important part of life. I mean, it, it's really the best parts of life. And yet we try to mute them out. We, we, we try to add stigma to it. We try to add stigma to like, go climb a damn mountain, man. You know, um, I go for a walk down this you know i go for like a solid hour walk um almost every day now um and i prefer to go hiking there are great places in central texas where you could basically do rock climbing it's really fun but the, even on my walk out here there's that ugly cat um there's like uh you know it's way out in the boonies there's there's this you know these one lane bridges right because it goes over like a, a creek and on that one lane bridge, I like to climb on the side and and put myself in a in a in a minimal amount of danger and climb because it's much more fun than just walking. But according to the utilitarian way of seeing existence and this way of seeing life of over conveniencing everything and and making everything nice, soft and cuddly and comfy, where's the fun in that? You know, and that's what makes people want to destroy things. That's how you get Luddites. Is people get so tired of a lack of suffering that they become, you know, fat boomers who uh, all, all they do is think about how uh, they're dying and they're not fine with their mortality. We'll get to that though. Let's see what our buddy said here. 
I'm going to pop my back. As I've said before, sitting down is poisonous. Go for a walk every day as much as you can. Move. Do yoga. Right, Stretch. Do squats. Move your muscles around. Move around, man, because you're going to start getting sore later. You're going to start not being able to move certain parts of your body. You need to know your body, man. Um, that's something I really learned when I did boxing, which I wish I could afford to do as an adult, but it's expensive. And I'm not going to buy a bag and, you know, make a lot of noise and punch it. I'd prefer to go to boxing gym, but they're like 80 bucks a month. So, but I really love boxing. Um, so I know, right. Once had a fat buddy, we pressured him into changing to be healthier with tough love. It's not even a thing of malice or hatred, right? Right. You know, that's the thing. Like I have, you know, plenty of people that I know who are fat. Right. And, you know, with guys, especially you can kind of just tell them like, Hey dude, you're a fat ass. That issue you have is because you are fat. And it's literally out of love. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not hating on you. I don't think like, like your opinions are lesser. I don't think you're a lesser person. I think you're just weak. We're all, we all have our things, right? It's not a bad thing to be weak. That's what a muscle is. A muscle is weak and then it's, you can make it strong. Just do it. Have, go to the damn gym, go for a walk. Stop eating as much. Right? It's common sense, but we don't live in common sense world anymore. Yes, yes. Things are scrubbed and directed towards a wide audience. Correct. Uh, that's the thing. Before the coof, what, um, for like 10, 15, 10, maybe since Titanic or so, major movie studios depended on one giant film every year, whereas like before. 2000 or so um they would release like 50 films a year and then that's how they made their money and every now and then you have a giant big film everybody loves it it, it makes a billion dollars now every year there has to be that but there's a caveat now post coof i don't even think they have enough money honestly to make big films there hasn't been a giant film since um the the thanos man or you know there's been a couple but they just haven't oh no there's been spider-man never mind um, Spider-Man was big, but still for two years or so, there just wasn't anything. But again, it's like, do we need do Jesus Christ? Do we need another Spider-Man? Do we need, do we need more Star Wars movies? Jesus Christ. You know, it's, it's like make a, something new for once, but they can't, right? We live, I've talked about this, right? We live, it's very simple. It's a math, it's a, it's a dumb math equation, right? You have all this debt and you have less and less revenue. You have all these people amassing debt who are less and less useful, who do less and less good things and take risk and add to the economy. But you have, but you have, so you have less and less revenue, but you have more debt. You're going to get crappy films because of that, because these giant studios are literally on a thin margin. They have to spend, you know, 500 million to make 1 billion, whereas before they could spend 1 million and make 100 million. You know? It's basically where we're at. And you don't turn back from that. It just gets worse until it implodes. But yeah, struggle is absolutely necessary to be a full person. Correct. Yeah, people who don't struggle, which is the issue with a lot of modern women, is that it's like you meet, especially pretty girls, right? That you meet, they're just. There's no personality with a lot of them. Absolutely no struggle. The, the only struggle they've ever had is trying to wave through all the, you know, you know what I mean. Next slide. All right, so we'll bring this up real quick. I think this is actually something I wanted to read. Turn to pages 260, children. Um, or 269. Nice. Yes. So centralized nations. Oh, no, let's let's go through this. So rising entrepreneurship. No, here we go. 
The Industrial Revolution had begun to create employment opportunities for the weak, sickly, and old. Sedent sedentary work, I think that's how you say sedentary, sedentary work, hitherto rare, had come into its own. Rising entrepreneurship and capitalism favored the boss who had had the time to accumulate capital and experience. Roads had improved. A general affected by gout could now command a battle from his wagon. And decrepit diplomats could travel from London to Vienna or Moscow. Centralized nation states increased the need for scribes and an enlarged bourgeoisie and bureaucracy. The new and small class of old men had a greater chance of survival because their lives at home, on the street, and at work had become physically less demanding. Aging had become a way of capitalizing life. Years at the desk, either at the counter or the school bench, began to bear interest on the market. The young of the middle class, whether gifted or not, were now for the first time sent to school, thus allowing the old to stay on the job. The bourgeoisie, who could afford to eliminate the social death by avoiding retirement, created childhood to keep their, yo their young under control. Along with economic status of the old, the value of their bodily functions increased. In the 16th century, a young wife is dead a young wife is death to an old man. And in the 17th century, old men who play with young maids dance with death. At the court of Louis XIV, the old lecher was a laughingstock. By the time of the Congress of Vienna, he had turned into an object of envy. To die while courting one's grandson's mistress became the symbol of a desirable end. Big. Big. Getting lost in youth getting lost in this idea of I'm always young. I'm always young. So now we'll read what I said. Beep. Capitalization of death. Rise. So yeah, uh, we read that. Um, men could spend less time working and on the street, but oh yeah. So we already went through that. Um, natural death became anyone who could afford to die as a patient. The onset of death, even at a below average age, should not be afforded utter dismay, but rather a reminder to us that death can encapture us in its hold at any time. However, in modern times, allowing health anomalies to be a part of our lives, we damn them as something bringing down our status. The mission becomes a, new, a need to remedy, flaunting one's own wealth. So, yes, health anomalies, like I said before, are almost like this thing you need to look down upon. Like, oh, he has warts. Oh, he has a hunch. Oh, huh. It, it, it becomes less spiritual. I mean, you, you, you read a story when you're a child about these things. Um, I used to love, like, Aesop's fables, but I also just loved legends and myths when I was a kid and, and just spooky stories, stuff that's very archetypal. Archetypes have been shifted away because archetypes are racist and sexist and evil because they what, reveal truth about who, who you are, about the spirit within. Um, and so we've morphed this idea of uh, like a health anomaly, quirks about who you are. We morphed it into something negative, something that a blemish, something you must change uh, unless you're fat. Um, let's see what we got here. When there's no period, when there's no period of true adulthood, it almost it almost kind of devalues youth itself. When there's no period of true adulthood, yes, because uh, you know modern man seems to spend that time right. We 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 treat childhood in the way that he mentioned. We treat it as something uh, as, as as almost a. A, a social construct, and I know that's like a lefty word at this point, but a uh, term, but a social construct of this new modern era where you, where childhood isn't something seen as uh, a, an era of development, but seen as, okay, now you're a child, you go to school, you do these things, you're, you're a dumb kid. Um, and 
at some point you go through a transition. We've talked about this in Neo Identity um, in that video. This this transition from a boy to a man, which I would say is a lot more important than a girl to a woman. Um, a boy needs to experience fear. He needs to experience pain. He needs to experience all sorts of things if he's if he's uh, you know allowed to be a man. Um, whereas women, it's women, it's more of like um, mastering modesty, mastering manners, mastering basically uh humility and hum and, and humbleness honestly it's more of um it's more of a personal journey than in a spiritual one than a than a, a physical endurance test for women um but no none of this anymore they all sit in school uh so that as you said uh these old people um can continue to stay young they can continue to um be pelosi be chuck schumer uh, be Joe Biden and, and, um, you know, uh, what's, what am I trying to say here? Um, command armies from, you know, their throne, uh, you know, and, and he even mentions that can't, the only people who ever lived their entire life working were Kings and I forgot the other one. Um, but specifically Kings and generals, I think. Um, but, you know, the statesmen should not, right? These people, they don't command anything. They're, um, this isn't, this isn't, right? I guess we'll get into it. You know, as statesmen, specifically in, in, in the system that we live, they're not, they don't function as like moral uh, or morale maintainers. They function as people who steal your money and give it, well, mainly to themselves, but uh, their voters. Um, but, yeah, you and I have discussed this a bit, but the contemporary education system is unbelievably unhealthy for the most for most boys. Yeah, um, it's it's something I've talked about a lot, um, so I won't get into it too much. But it's if you can, it's almost convenient for you know the the statesmen and the the regime of this unhealthy nation and and culture consumerist culture here i'm going to try to i move my arms a lot so um for this consumerist culture the 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 owners right the lords of us uh, serfs they benefit from people wanting to stay young wanting to keep feeding them the machine rather than you know for like voting for instance most people who vote right the highest the older you get the more likely you are to vote um, because you want your social security, you want your socialism for old people. Um, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, they're all for socialism for old people. Um, and yeah. So capitalization of death, what's what, anything else I can say about that? Um, no. Not, not, not anything I haven't already said. Um, this one's fun. You like that picture? Um, viewing death negatively. It, it also, AKA, uh, image. Yeah. This is basically just about immature boomers is what I'm getting at on in this little slide. We don't see death as a natural around the corner endeavor, nor do we see it as a pathway to somewhere else, but as an utter end. It all goes back to a rejection of our eternal souls and an insecurity our culture has with being old. All old people try to look all old people try to look as young as possible, and it's just a reflection of their life being a rejection of growth and improvement. They're afraid of meeting their maker and are not at ease with who they are. In death, they are no longer able to settle. They are no longer able to settle to to settle what they never settled in death. They are. Yeah. So they're never able to settle who they are. I, I think I have dyslexia. Um, and so in a secularized death and the secularized decay of our culture, we no longer see death as something natural, but to be avoided at all at all costs. Um, yes. And so we can get spiritual there. Is there another slide? I think there's one. There's two more. So I'll talk about it a little bit. but. Um, 
we'll talk about boomers. So boomers uh, never got like a real spiritual journey, and they were really the first. They were the first to have gone from beginning to end in the post World War II neolib neocon regime, globalist regime, and so they've benefited from the the fruits of uh, what's this? Oh, okay. They've benefited from the fruits of cheap goods, uh, of a fast economy, of you know cars, and and they 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 don't see. Well, one thing is you know they hate us because they look down upon us when really it's um, they got to benefit from something that they didn't really start or cause. It was just it was going to happen regardless, and then the destruction of that system is going to happen regardless. And so it's really no one's fault. It's just a fact of nature. Um, but boomers, yeah, very self-obsessed and think that they just are the shit. Um, and in that process, I mean, you come across old people all the time. And you really will see, I mean, old men, they'll drive nice car, nice cars and wear sunglasses. And, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll do their little thing to feel young. Um, I can still do it, buddy. Hey, I got that. It's all right. You know, they're always like, I can do this myself when it's like, no, you're old and dying. Let me do it for you. They really, if you, if you spend time with boomers, they are busy bodies. They really have no chill. Um, the ones who have the most chill are obviously the ones who grew up in the country, um, you know, lining fence posts for 12 hours a day on their farm as a young kid. Those ones, they didn't turn out better. They still ended up materialistic, but they still understand what, you know, time to chill out, time to do work, right? They, they have that separation. They understand separations. Most urbanite boomers really don't. Um, they spent most of their life really just lollygagging. Um, Yes, I feel particularly bad for some of them, uh, for some of them being sandwiched between an era of potential. Um, I think of a lot of younger boomers as like ultimately the most shunned people. Um, them and 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 the X generation. Um, I think they'll they 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 just made the most mistakes. They divorced a lot. They cheated a lot. They did a lot of drugs and drinking. And a lot of them are indebted. A lot of them never developed any life skills whatsoever. Um, yeah, it, it's rough. Um, but essentially, they've, they've, they want to extend their their youth, right? And and older women, you can really see that where they dye their hair, they wear. God forbid, you'll see it. You know what I'm talking about? They wear yoga pants. Seventy year old women wearing yoga pants. That's one of my favorite things to see when I go to the store. But yes believe it is true it's everywhere and you uh you um fothalian you need you need you need to get a better moniker my dude i can't read it um fothalian fothalian it's my it's like mine no one can ever read my name my uh my, my moniker properly it's oros um but uh, you know i'll be doxxed at some point so who cares um but uh uh, I'll probably just go by my first name at some point. Nonetheless, you'll see it with a lot of older women who really like can't accept that they are now in grandma phase. Once you reach 50, old lady, you got to accept it. But no, I want to work. I'm an independent woman and I'm very intelligent. Y'all, let me give you a piece of my mind. And it's just they never they never became women in the first place because they were thrown into the materialize it, the 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 very unisexual materialized um you know uh i think it's almost like uh you know i i don't know the the philosopher the the ancient greek philosopher but those ancient greek philosophers hedonists um your ability to to not get overexcited by pleasure like take part in the pleasure and understand it but master who you are um, and right, they're all degenerates, but they're brilliant in their own way, right? And that's kind of what we see with women who went through this like, I'm gonna get a good job and I'm gonna, you know, 
I'm because I'm I I'm just as good as a man. I'm just as smart as a man. I'm just as I can do as much as a man. And when you're in that mentality, but you're a woman, um, it's not good. But uh, if you if you, it, yeah, see, that's because I think of your region of the world, but also um, you just you got to go to like a very urbanite, horribly degenerate city um, to see it. You if you go really in America, if you just go to Houston, L.A., even, you know, San Antonio, Austin, I, any major city. You'll see it, dog. Um, but I'm in the South, so you see it even more. Um, you know, and, and that's the thing about culture is it just like in Texas, the, the the degenerate culture just spread like wildfire. Texas is not Texas anymore. Um, though I wouldn't, you know, Texas has Southern culture, but it's not really, it's not really Dixie. It has way too much Southwestern culture in it too. It's too, everyone here is a Rolling Stone Everyone here is very hedonistic. It's not. You just got to come here and see the filth. You, you'll understand. Because. When you get really like in in the like, that's what I was saying in our conversation, man. Texas is like. It's overrun by the urbanite, you know whatever this new way of seeing the world is where everyone like there's no such thing as truth everything is subjective be a complete disgusting degenerate fulfill all your pleasures like full-on grug dipshit way of thinking like there's no art to it there's no genuine discovery everything is just nihilism right it's nihilism we are a nihilistic materialistic the only way to happiness is the sterner right like self-obsession uh you know uh just get as many things as possible right that's what we have and especially in texas because everyone here we already were a state of like overindulgence in our culture of like all this money all this fucking barbecue every, everyone here is fat so it's it's just it was just a matter of time until California fell apart and they just all come here because um, they fancy themselves cowboys, apparently. Um, yeah, incredibly sad. Yeah, it sucks. It, it It's Texas is done for. There's no saving the state. Um, I honestly think if I'm right about the future and like this catabolic breakdown and people kind of start their own communities or countries, whatever you want to call it. I'm not going to be in Texas. I'm going to be way far away from here in like Nebraska or something. This place is just too overrun, man. Um, yeah, new new people who were down there in the 50s, they said it was wonderful. I guarantee you it was. It was the complete... It, nothing was as developed as it is now. I mean, Texas is the... It's not going to be as big as California was in terms of just how culturally influential it was. It's just become the the colony the 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 last bastion of californians to be californian it's it's like they ha get to have their cake and eat it too and then this place collapses as well because nothing stops the pause regime from its tendrils getting in every aspect of our lives um, because ultimately you can control americans through their innate nihilism because all they care about is their goodies, their things, their Avengers movies. Um, the only principle, the principled ones will very much show their fruits as they just distance themselves from that world because they'll have to. Um, I don't really know when that is, but I don't see you either let the system destroy you, take you over, or you leave it, right? Is there any other option? I don't think there is. Um, you know, that's why with this, I, with, with just this idea of iatric theosis, I actually want to live by what I'm talking about here. If I get cancer, I'm not getting chemotherapy. You know, I'm, I'm going to live as God truly intended. Um, and that's that, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, our culture is done for.
Like, that's just something you just got to accept. Like, that's just something that, like, right off the bat, like, it's dead. It's done. You don't, like, stop playing Weekend at Bernie's. This is this is over. Done for. It's all about this right here. All right. Love the Lord our God with all your heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Um, Where were we? Uh, so the dance of death. Uh, we'll bring that up. See if that's relevant in the book. Uh, 259. Nah. Okay. There, wait, was it 259? It was. I didn't even highlight anything. Oh, this is great preparation on my part. Let's see here. So I'll read my part. So the, the perception of death has morphed in, in uh, pre and post. You can tell I made this like right off the bat. I really, I wanted to make this video a couple days ago. Or I, wa I was already preparing for it, like mentally. But I just made all this like in the last couple hours. So, you know, sorry. But I, I just can't do it this weekend. And then if I don't do it this weekend, I have like a month pretty much where I can't make it. So I had to do it today. Um, the perception of death is morphed in pre to po yeah okay so in pre to post Christian European civilization in the 15th and 16th centuries in Europe it was seen as faux pas to have a doctor intervene in the process of death if there were empiric signals that showed um, a person's inevitability of passing on he was expected to follow it for the dying person it was a personal and spiritual endeavor they were prepared and ready even before Christian Europe the experience of death was seen as a reason to dance and to celebrate. As the friend, family member, community community leader was now making his passage to the afterlife or a new world or a new life. Uh, yes, I do think that world is the best option. Um, I would choose places like Mississippi, but they are far too beautiful um, and culturally um, extravagant in my opinion. And I think Californians, because they've already found like corners of Arkansas, they've already overrun Texas. They'll probably go for Oklahoma because it's just close and it's pretty enough. Um, they're just going to overrun those places. You need to find, and this is just an idea I've directly stolen from uh, Ernst von Seil, the conscious caracal who was on my show a couple months ago. Um, you just need to find the most barren, horrible shithole that no one wants to live. Like flat nothingness. That's what you want. You know, South Dakota, I would personally probably, I don't know. It's really freaking cold, but I've been there. Um, they don't have state income tax. It's literally, I mean, I'm not shitting you in contiguous America. Like aside from, you know, Alaska's barren, most of Alaska. Um, in contiguous America, South Dakota, West South Dakota is literally like the most, um, the least densely populated area of the country. That's where you want to be. It's not the pretty areas. It's not. The, oh, Southern Dixie. I, I really wish I love Dixie. This is my cult. This is the closest thing I have to the culture. This is where my family's from. And I have family that goes back to 1600s in Virginia, I, I I love this place. I really do. But it's going to be, depending on how the collapse happens, Californians will take Mississippi. The degenerates will take Mississippi. They're already in Tennessee. I'm sorry to say they're already in Kentucky. They're in those states. All that's left is the deep, deep south, and they're going to take that too. Sorry. Sorry. West Virginia as well. They'll take West Virginia. They're they're going to go to every spot that they allowed, you know, hillbillies to die off due to a lack of jobs, which made them, you know, go to drugs. They'll take those areas. They won't have any shame about it because they're all rolling stones, right? They have no culture. They have no interest in, like, settling and creating a lovely community. They hate that. They hate community. They're all nihilists. They, they like the ability to to duck and move and go to a new place. And they're going to do exactly that. They're going to, they love hill country. That's why like where I live, it's nothing but Californians turning everything into a winery and a coffee shop. 
You're going to get that in West Virginia. Guarantee it. I'll bet money. So go to South Dakota. Go to the places. They, they you literally, they would go there and be like, I don't want to live here. It's too windy and it's too cold. This, oh man, Lake Tahoe is so much prettier than this. Too bad I turned it into a shithole. Basically it. Um, yeah, I always love the bios in the South culture. And the, yeah, me too. I know. I, I love it more than you do, dog. I love it more than you do. And it's all going to be taken over by them. Um, and yeah, you would fit because I've been to Michigan, dude. I've been to Illinois, you know, Chicago, South Dakota. I lived in South Dakota for a little while. Cold. I mean, I've never experienced cold like I have specifically in Chicago. That's the most cold I've ever been uh, in terms of just how I felt. It's awful. It's horrible. Um, but that's what I'd have to do, right? You gotta, you don't get to have preference in the collapse. You go where you can homestead and serve God, which when you serve God, you ultimately feel the most meaningful and happy. So that's where I want to be. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, and quick aside, which that's all I do asides and tangents. Um, but I always tie it up, right? If you, if you talk to a boomer, a lot of them are very well-traveled and that's all they talk about. Other than when they're talking about how they're basically insecure about their own death. They talk about where they've gone. Oh, yeah, I've been to Utah and Moab, and I've driven my Jeep in the fucking Moab hills or whatever. And, yeah, I went I went and saw Leonard Skinner in 1982, and they just love talking about how they've traveled. And I want to tell you, there's literally no nothing you learn from traveling. There's nothing gained from traveling. It's decadence. It's like eating a delicious cake. That's all it is cultural enrichment is wonderful um but it, it, there's nothing in the bible or in any text spiritual text that says yeah you need to travel the world at an airplane and see everybody it's goofy but that's all boomers have right boomers are not wise people boomers are very stupid and very they i'm really i don't mean that like personally like yeah it's just they don't they aren't like you go pre this era old people were extremely wise and had many things to say they don't anymore they just don't they 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 grew up in a culture of decadence so all they have is their journeys and the best journeys that they ever had were going on a vacation in moab or going on vacation in the mountains of colorado or new zealand it's just they're not well, wise people, basically. Wow. Is that negative 50 in Celsius or Fahrenheit? Um, either way, that's really, really cold. Um, I don't think I've ever experienced it. You know, with wind chill, even that, I've never really experienced anything under the, like, negative 15, you know, negative 10 Fahrenheit. Um, but I have, like... And this is something I would have to, it's a spiritual thing that I have to figure out, but I really, I won't even say it because accepting your, your health issues uh, is just stupid. Like I get bronchitis and I don't even smoke anymore. And my mom had this issue. My sister has this issue. Um, but, uh, you know, honestly, I'm not going to, I'm not going to accept it. If I, if I'm in the cold, I'm going to own it. That's it. Not even gonna, not even gonna say. Well, I get being no. See, no, that's what we're against here. We're against our own weaknesses. We can overcome. Um, there's too many miracles that have happened, and we all know them, and we have them in our own personal lives, and we hear them in stories. There's too many miracles to just accept that I just am the way who I am. Um, now, again, I don't want to contradict myself, but you need to come to terms with who you are. But you also, if you have health issues, I mean, it literally said in the Bible, Jesus, Jesus is going to deliver you health. I think coming to terms with chronic issues is literally the way of solving those chronic issues. If it's not literal, it will at least be spiritual. Um, but trying to remedy and medicate it is a way of 
denying your own culpability uh, in in uh, your own culpability in developing those issues in the first place. Because normally most issues come down to spiritual accountability, right? Um, definitely. I was raised by people who were born, who were into tourism and I do not get it. It's not even about trying to find cultures that you love. It's about a sort of materialistic representative thing. Yeah. Uh, it, all, it really all is said in tourism, right? They're tourists. That's it. They, they go somewhere and they're like, Ooh, wow. Take their pictures and they leave. They don't embrace it. Um, you know, that's why I like bald and bankrupt. He really embraces Russian and Eastern European, Central Asian cultures. Um, you know, it's something I've I've done in my personal life because I come from such a multicultural place. I developed a pretty decent understanding of Spanish. You know, I kind of know Russian. I can read it and I know a good few words. I can say I speak Russian and whatnot, but uh, and I can't speak Russian. Uh, you know, but it's something I try to immerse myself into like a good movie or a video game, right? Um, so it, it's, yeah, it's just, on their part, it's almost like a bragging right. That's really what they want to do is, uh, is brag. Um, but I really want to solidify what I said, right? If you, we're going to get comfy here. Um, for me, I think my accepting my chronic bronchitis which really it's not like bad, bad. It's like in the winter, I sometimes get, you know, mucusy and shit. I think there's a difference between trying to go to a doctor, a bunch of specialists, trying to find out every little thing, you know, hypochondriac, which honestly a lot of Americans are. Um, there's a hypochondria uh, freaking pandemic um, crisis of hypochondria. And uh, I, I think there's a big difference between coming to spiritual acceptance like, God, I, depending on what you're trying to teach me here, I want you to give me a sign or a signal, um, right? Like, we could, we could say it's this. Let's say it's this that's causing my, uh, my, my mucousy. proclivities um to try and remedy that by going to a doctor you know uh even in a, another example is i had really bad acne when i was a teenager which is literally it's a it's an evolutionary development it's it's correlated to you know law what is it called a slow life history strategy it's 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 basically if you know basically how fast life slow life history strategy it's a it's basically a, a, an evolutionary signal to say i'm too young do not procreate with me yet because i want to develop more that's basically what acne does it's it it scares away potential mates so that you can develop more and be a better mate um it's literally natural it's a good thing right it's 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 a and it's you know it, it's um it helps develop uh kind of a self it's self-confidence as well because at all times you're fucking butt ugly and your face is greasy um but it develops into something greater but what do we do right we go to dermatologists we go to the store and get cream to try and remedy it take something that is a part of who we are and turn it into an illness and that's all that i'm saying is trying to do that is not beneficial to your soul. It's not beneficial to your, your, um, to what makes you you. Um, and for things that stunt us, it's better to accept that and 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 move past it mentally, right, mind over matter, than to turn it into an illness. Um, word. I'll see you later, homie. I, I, I can, I, I go on for way too long. It's okay. Um, all right. Final slide. I don't even, let's see if I can read it. I might have to get low. 
because I put the clouds behind the text. I did. I I didn't realize. I thought I could read it earlier. Um, let's do that. No, that doesn't help. All right. Well, we'll figure it out. Um, understanding and accepting. Getting personal. Getting personal. This is why. Well, I guarantee. I think it's because I was looking on my freaking other laptop. That's why. This is going to be hilarious to anyone watching. Oh yeah. Okay. This is why I embrace death and death and whatever I I may encounter, whether it be cancer or I be shot in the chest. I oh, mean, I really should have. I should have prepared better. Let's go. Uh, I can go to Google Slides and just read it there. <laughs> this is really funny. Everything about my slideshow has just revealed about how little I prepared. So. My shoulder is burning from sitting in this chair. Okay, boom. We will go here and change the background to, I don't know, gray. All right, boom. Did it change it on here as well? No. But I'll still read it. Getting personal. This is why I embrace death and whatever I may encounter, whether it be cancer or being shot in the chest. The story of life and what you make the now is so important. It is about bringing glory to your almighty God that he might show you mercy in the very end. But even more than that, your own peace on this planet and in this life is only found in embracing death. Your ancestors did just the same, as they knew it was always there waiting for them. But materialism has made the modern Westerner duped into thinking that they are immortal, immortal here on Earth, and that it's rather they are owed everything, but they owe everything to their creator. That, excuse me, and it's rather they aren't owed everything, but they owe everything to their creator. I've encountered death in many ways personally, and it is why something that I am, and it, and it, and it is why it is something that I am unbothered by. It is something I have a healthy fascination and acceptance of. But modern medical, but the modern me medical industrial complex deems it the worst sin of all. To be fine with one's own mortal life, but immortal... Man, yes. To be fine with one's own mortal life and immortal soul. Oh, no, yeah. So, yeah. This is why you don't stream late in the day. But modern, yeah, the modern medical industrial complex deems it the worst sin of all uh, to rather, yeah, be fine with one's own immortal life, but not their immortal soul. They see it as an affront to their, to their system and science uh, when really it is a simple, it is simple unacceptance of the spirit of the Antichrist control over you through fear and decadence. Embrace your mortality. Right. So. Um, that was terrible. Um, I apologize for not preparing well in that way, but still we'll, we'll get on the points here. Um, personally, so I've, in, I've encountered death. Um, sometimes I forget the, the less interesting times, but I've, I've almost fallen off a ladder that was probably 30 to 40 feet in the air. I would have, I would have really, really liked permanently broken something or died um but in the way it happened i probably would have fallen and broken my head or something um you know i've been i've been shocked in a way that i i could have been i i guess i could say i've been electrocuted but it didn't last too long stuff like that right stuff that when it happens in the moment um And immediately after, you're like, oh, shit, I almost died. Um, and it's something that I don't, I don't know if everyone needs to be exposed to death. Um, but rather, they need to, to have experiences in their life, whether it be in sports or just getting out, that they encounter death. 
um, so that they are familiar with it and fine with it, like our ancestors did throughout their entire life, right? Death was a very real constant thing that they're very well aware of and pretty okay with. Um, and let's see if I can read it on here. Oh, yeah. And, and what we're kind of taught is that it's almost an evil sin, right? But it really is just a sin of the Antichrist. Um, it's living in the spirit of the Antichrist when you allow him, when you allow that spirit itself, right, to embody you and rule you through fear and desire. Um, because you start making decisions based on fear. And so you allow evil to happen all throughout your life, all throughout the world, because you would rather, uh, you would rather that spirit take care of you when really um, it's just possessed you. And that's really all the over medicalization of, of our lives has done. It's turned us into these drones, these freaked out bug people who have no self-confidence, who, who don't feel that they can own their life and control their life and accept the inevitable. They're constantly being fed this idea that they can live for as long as they, oh, as long as I need, um, and experience all the delicious cookies and pizza and Avengers movies that they want um, as long as they let this 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 evil spirit uh, to guide them. That's really what it is, right? To allow the fear of of this evil um, that really this antichrist, this evil itself, uh, is perpetuating, allowing it to control you. Um, and it's 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 not a surprise that people who are the worst are, you know, people who say that like that guy who couldn't get a uh, uh, a heart transplant um, because he's not, he didn't take the COOF medicine. Um, and, you know, uh, who knows if he's going to die or not, uh, depending on that transplant. He probably would live a little bit longer with a new heart, but if you need a new heart, I don't know. Um, it's kind of rough. Uh, regardless, he's being denied life um, because uh, the spirit, this spirit, this evil this evil, well, it really is like a compilation of evil. It's a, it's, it's greed. It's really all seven deadly sins acting at, at once um, through our supposed rulers, um, and uh, they can easily control a very just bovine, um, materialistic people uh, through this fear. Because it's like, oh no! If you go outside, you'll get you'll catch the evil disease. the The evil spirits will take hold of you. Do this chant and wear this. Um, you know, key, I like Bill Mars. Uh, uh, he made a good analogy. Keep the magical scarab with you. Um, and so ultimately, rather than being free of of that stress and that, um. <laughs> that stress and that uh, that uh, control over our soul, over over our decisions, um, because we want to maintain the flow of cake. Um, we can rather be free because those material desires, those those decadent desires really don't bring us meaning and happiness like the Lord Jesus Christ does, right, in his teachings, and, and living in that um, perpetual truth that brings ultimate peace. Um, and, uh, yeah, so let's, let's look over there just again. So accept death, embrace your mortality, Free, because if you aren't, you're you're liable and going to constantly act in error and evil, uh, rather than 
um, realizing you don't have to do any of that, right? Jesus has promised you great health and a great life and uh, eternal peace in him if you just don't live in the fear of evil, right? If, if you don't embrace it and act in evil ways. And evil is normally idle, right? Evil is normally, uh, well, I just want to stay a fat couch potato. What do I do to maintain that? And that's really where we've been led to. Um, and that's where this medical establishment has really ultimate power over people. Because, you know, if you look in politics, universal health care is always brought up. And the idea of this healthcare system is a constant debate, even in Europe, in places with universal health care. It's this constant entitlement and bitching and moaning. And it really is just, it's just a denial of the spirit of the Lord. It's, it's not accepting that they don't need something earthly to bring them peace and happiness. So um, accept the death. Accept it as a part of life and uh, embrace what the Lord has for you in store. Um, do not be afraid of fate, right? Anyway, uh, it's fantastic. Um, sorry again for my lack of preparedness and uh, goofing a little bit there, but hopefully uh, you all got something out of it. Um, it was a good show. I look forward to talking more about this, um, this phenomenon and, uh, goodbye. Ed Dutton reference there. Okay. Love you guys. God bless. And, uh, thank you for watching.